So admittedly, uh, it's a big challenge to sort of work through what in what way this particular test is going to be so crucial to Nebuchadnezzar's journey of salvation and of why this particular test is uh, was the one that he used in order to try and see the future and come out safe in the end and so on. Notice he's interested in the end in salvation and being delivered from what he fears uh, presumably is some sort of plot against him. Now, in order to sort of pull all this together, we have to start actually at the end of the story because at the very end of the story, we read uh, that the king answered to Daniel after he is, Daniel has re revealed the dream itself as well as the interpretation. And he is, says, truly, uh, truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. That's the test, right? Who can reveal the truth of the dream? Uh, then the king gave Daniel high honors and many gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. So Daniel, at the end of this story, is going to become singled out as the one person that Nebuchadnezzar can actually trust, so much so that he exalts Daniel to a higher position of authority than any of the Magi. So why would Nebuchadnezzar do that given the start of our dream where Daniel is just one of the Magi who is going to be executed? Why would he trust Daniel? And the answer is that his test has uniquely shown Daniel and Daniel's God to be trustworthy. He is the one person that Nebuchadnezzar can trust. But how did that come about? That's the question. How did that come about? And the simple answer is in the, sort of the geniusness of the original test. Okay, so let's uh, um, talk about this uh, from the perspective of what, say, the Magi were normally trying to do. What was the normal arrangement between the king and the Magi? All right, when the Magi gave their their predictions of the future, they most likely gave them the way the oracle at Delphi did in classical Greece. Uh, they were, the, the predictions were deliberately vague. They had to be specific enough, but also vague, because you didn't want the predictions to be too falsifiable, right? If a prediction is falsifiable, then it won't take long before the king realizes the predictions aren't really coming from the gods. They're not very secure. And so you would then have your head be taken off. So you're, you're a false prophet at that point. So you don't want to run the risk of having these predictions be shown to be false because then that would rob the magi of all their authority and power. So if you take the oracle at Delphi, it a couple uh, with a couple famous examples. Okay, at one point a king sent to the oracle and was was inquiring whether they should enter into battle against a, an enemy king, and the oracle's response was that and it was that a great king would fall that day. Well, th they interpreted that as confirming that they should go into battle and that this other king who was even more famous across the world, a Persian king, that he would he would die that day. But in reality, it was their own king that would die, you see? But, but the oracle wasn't technically wrong, even though they interpreted it a different direction. Another time, the oracle said that the Greeks would be saved by the wooden wall or by a wooden wall. Well, what did that mean, a wooden wall? Uh, they didn't have wooden walls. So some people said they need to build literal wooden walls. Others said, no, that doesn't mean a literal wall. It means a wall of defense that is made out of wood. And so they suggested that they make ships and use their, their navy to thwart the Persians. And by the way, they were right. The ones who said you should build the ships, they used the, the, 
they, they were correct. So anyway, all this to say, you can see how the, the, the predictions could be just vague enough, the ones we know anyway, uh, from, the, from the Oracle of Delphi, um, many of the ones we know. Were, some were specific, of course, uh, and others were clearly vague, and then that meant that you couldn't falsify them. But the king knew this. He knew this was part of sort of the game, was that they would produce this information, and, um, you know, uh, he would have to sort of work through that with of exactly what that meant. Now, uh, in this case, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar cannot afford to have this kind of vagueness and non-specificity, and he can't even afford to risk that the that he tell the dream because however specific a interpretation might be and however true it is, Nebuchadnezzar simply won't know if they're telling them the truth. And since an assassination plot can could very likely arise right from within the Magi, he can't really trust any of them. You see, it's a issue of trust. He can't trust, even if they do share the truth, because he does. He doesn't know how to know. He doesn't know how to trust whom to trust, rather, in this situation. So the question is, whom can he trust? And here's the here's the um, here's the great test. All right, um, he wants to know if your God can reveal the truth about the future. Then that would mean he could also reveal the truth about the past, right? You can predict the future, so predict the past. Uh, it's been said by many people, you know, if uh, I've heard this from a number of sources, you know, uh, that uh, people go to like a palm reader, you know, at a state fair or something, and uh, instead of asking f for um, the future, ask them about the past, you know, what did you have for breakfast? Or what did you have for dinner the night before? What did you do the previous evening? You know, that's a real test. Can they reveal the truth about the past? Because that would then be falsifiable, right? If you can reveal the truth about the past, and you fail, excuse me, if you fail in your in your revelation of the truth about the past, because the past becomes uh, the past becomes falsifiable. You see, I know the past, so now we can test it. Do, can they really reveal the truth, this God? And uh, so it's a brilliant test. Can, they re can, can this God reveal the truth about the past? Now think of this. We're in a book of Daniel, which is going to tell us a lot about the future. It's going to offer many, many predictions about the future, many of which have yet to happen. Some, some of which, anyway, for sure have not yet happened. Others have happened. But you see, we get a record of the past. We know uh, from Scripture, there are certain predictions, say, about the life of Jesus, and those predictions were uttered. We all, all scholars agree that they were written before Jesus came. We have copies of the texts, you know, that date long before Jesus came. So some of the predictions specifically about Jesus are a record of the past, and those predictions have become falsifiable. Was the Messiah born in Bethlehem? Was, you know, was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Because Micah said the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Was Jesus a descendant of David? Because the prophet said that Jesus would be, the Messiah would be a descendant of David. Did the Messiah have a forerunner, a messenger who prepared the way for him? Did Jesus have that? Because Malachi said he would, Isaiah said he would. So there's a record of the past and the history then becomes falsifiable. In other words, prophecies, predictions from the Bible which have happened are then validated, right? Now, obviously, if they give us a prediction which is to a specific time frame and something doesn't happen, that would be then falsifiable. All right, so just a simple example of how the principle applies still to how we think about um, Christianity in general. So Nebuchadnezzar, anyway, he has now this perfect test. Can this God reveal the truth about the past? And here's the most interesting, brilliant aspect of his test, okay? Let's say one of the Magi, he, the, of the Magi, he knows the truth about the dream, but he's a part of the assassination plot. Is he going to reveal this to Nebuchadnezzar? No, of course not. He's, he's not going to reveal the true dream because that's, uh, because he's, he's part of the plot. So, 
he, he's stuck. He can't tell the truth about what's happened because he's part of the fulfillment of what the dream is going to point to. So he's going to be caught in a lie, so he has to remain silent. But if somebody is not a part of the plot and they, and by the way, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't mind if those people are killed, right? Because they're part of the plot, so he's safe then. But if there's a Magus who can, whose God will reveal the truth about the past, reveal the truth of the dream, then Nebuchadnezzar can trust that individual since they are aware that this dream is an assassination plot and yet they're telling Nebuchadnezzar about it. So if they're sharing it with him and they know what the dream is, then they are trustworthy. And therefore their God is also trustworthy. This is the true God who can reveal mysteries and the truths uh, about the future. And so Nebuchadnezzar can then trust that person. That's why in the end, the very act of Daniel offering the truth about the past in his dream, since in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, this is an assassination plot, it makes Daniel trustworthy, okay? Now, the interesting thing is that the actual interpretation of the dream is not quite what Nebuchadnezzar thinks. It was along the lines of what he thinks. It is. It does include the demise of Babylon for sure, but not of Nebuchadnezzar personally in the dream. In the dream, it doesn't quite come out that way. Nebuchadnezzar will actually be a head of gold and so on. So uh, in the case of uh, how the sort of psychology that Nebuchadnezzar is going through is explaining a lot of what's happening. And God, of course, is allowing this. He's permitted Nebuchadnezzar to go down this path because it sets the stage to show that Daniel is absolutely trustworthy and his God is trustworthy because he reveals the truth, even a truth that will, in a way, deliver Nebuchadnezzar. So in the end, Daniel gets exalted because he now becomes even more trusted than the other, mega, the other magi were. All right, so that's sort of what I think is going on to explain how the story unfolds to explain Nebuchadnezzar's uh, actions. So that leaves us then with, uh, with the next question, which is, oh, by the way, I should add that when, Nebuchad when Daniel says he negotiates this opportunity, you know, to, to have the, this, um, to stand before the king and reveal the dream. It's clear from what Daniel does next that he doesn't actually have the dream in his head. I mean, this is a desperate move by Daniel. He asks that they can uh, appoint a time for him to stand before the king and reveal the dream. But then what happens is Daniel and his friends go uh, and they seek mercy from the God of heaven. And that night, Daniel and his friends do not yet have the dream. I mean, as they're praying for mercy, notice if they're seeking mercy, right? Their, their lives are at stake. And they're plea, pleading to God for mercy to save them by offering the, the truth about what his dream was and then the interpretation of it. So, uh, just to put another side to that, that Daniel, we often read these sort of stories of Daniel as if Daniel is just sort of, uh, is, uh, is just un, uh, he, he's not the least bit fearful. He's not timid at all. He's just so confident and, and uh, that God is just going to, is, is saving him at every moment that there's no stress, you know, for these trials that he was going through when in fact he was, he and his friends were seeking the very mercy of God that they might survive because they'd all were under a death sentence at this point unless they could reveal the dream. So for Daniel as well, for his own faith, to receive the dream, um, what is his reaction going to be? And that comes next in, in uh, verses uh, 20 and following in this area here. What is Daniel going to emphasize in his prayer to God? And then what is he going to subsequently explain to Nebuchadnezzar before he reveals the dream. So he is going to reveal the dream and its interpretation, but there's a, 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 there's a, a section there uh, of the story where we have Daniel's prayer 
in response to God once the dream is revealed, what is he going to talk about in that prayer? And then what does he go on to then explain that he has learned through this experience to Nebuchadnezzar? So part of the revelation of the truth to Nebuchadnezzar from God is not just the truth of the dream and its interpretation, but Daniel's experience and Nebuchadnezzar's experience. Daniel has some wisdom to offer to Nebuchadnezzar about the whole experience he's going through that will sort of set the dream in context. So what is the prayer focused on? And then what does he subsequently explain to Nebuchadnezzar before he reveals his, his dream? That's, the, that's your next question. So best wishes and we'll see you next time.